This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. The previous chapter dealt with management. This one deals with leadership. Frankly, I find the distinction between management and leadership very difficult. Uh, they are listed separately in the syllabus. Uh, but of course, leadership is a very important aspect of management. And I think there's a, quite a bit of overlap uh, between the two subjects. Perhaps see leadership as a subcomponent of the overall management. And again, we're, we're concerned with uh, what makes a good leader. Just as we were in the last chapter concerned with what makes a good manager. And there are a number of names and theories that I'm afraid you just have to learn. First one is relatively simple. This was developed by the Ashridge Management College, uh, and it looked at leadership styles. Remember we, were, we talked about, we, we said that trait theory of management was no good, we're on to style theory. It's how you manage, how you lead that's going to be important. And uh, Ashridge uh, has these, this uh, uh, model where it identified four types of leadership style. And it has to be, uh, first of all, uh, 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 say uh, that we're dealing here with really a continuum. Uh, and the way you can lead is you can simply tell people what to do, completely authoritarian. No explanation, no persuasion at all. And then you move down a little bit and we can sell. So you are basically going to tell them what to do, but you sell that to them. You you try to argue and convince people that this is the right way they should be acting uh, and this is what they should be doing. You sell your ideas to them. Then you can uh, get even more participative. Uh, you can consult. You can say to people, look, we have a problem here. What do you think we should do? Uh, uh, but it, it will be the manager who makes the decision. And then finally, there is joins or joins with where it is almost a democratic decision between the manager and the group as to what should be done. So it's a continuum. And <coughs> Ashridge Management College uh, was careful never to say that one of these is best and the other ones are all wrong. Uh, uh, we'll see when we get onto something called contingency theory that it perhaps uh, depends on a number of variables. Uh, so it might be hard to ever uh, think when joins is going to be the correct way of leading, where it's going to be a very democratic decision. It might be okay if you're arranging a kind of uh, annual day's outing somewhere, or some sort of social activity that the employees were going to be part of. Their, their uh, kind of democratic decision as to what to do on the day off might be okay. Uh, but it's likely to, to give... Uh, probably the best decisions if you're uh, maybe deciding what production quotas are needed or how we should deal with a particular production problem. If you're dealing with people who are very uh, used to being told what to do and in many ways prefer to be told what to do because it's low risk, then maybe the, the sells method is, the, a big one, the tells method is better. Or if you're dealing with something which is very urgent, maybe you should just tell people what to do you guys got, haven't got the luxury of time to, to discuss uh, uh, with, with people because it is so urgent. By and large, for, for uh, all sorts of purposes, this one here probably comes in as being quite often the best one uh, to do. We'll see when we get on to looking at the motivation that being asked your opinion, being involved, uh, feeling that you can contribute to a problem can be very motivating. Uh, and consultation or participation is usually regarded as a very important motivator and a very positive way of leading. Blake and Mouton uh, developed a managerial grid uh, and they had out here concern for the task and concern for the people. That's high, low, low, high. It was originally uh, developed as a, a method uh, of 
appraising managers to see where they were maybe a bit weak and a bit and needed a little bit of training and so on here. But it was it was kind of put in, you can think of it as a grid here. Quite often coordinates are put on uh, to this here. But up here where there was great concern for people and hardly any concern for task, uh, this was what they called country club. It was always the manager saying, you know, I don't really care about results or tasks as long as my people are happy. There was almost no, uh, it, it was it, it was a very relaxed, uh, probably quite pleasant environment to be in, uh, but the manager probably kept missing the budgets. Out here you've got a very task orientated. This person would very much be interested in hitting the budgets and in a way couldn't care less uh, what pressure this put on staff, maybe what damage it did to staff. Uh, they, they really didn't care about staff at all. And this uh, person would, would probably hit their budgets, but this is probably not the sort of person you'd want to maybe work for for an awfully long time. Over here we have the, the team approach high concern for tasks, high concern for people, usually regarded as being the best position to be in, where the manager is firing very well on the two uh, 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 measurement uh, axes here, very concerned with people, gets on with his people or her people very well, but also always has an eye making sure the task is accomplished. Here we have, the, if you like, a fairly mediocre manager, perhaps middle of the road, And this is what was called impoverished. This leader had little concern for the task, little concern for the, uh, for the people. This leader was more or less a waste of space there. The middle of the road person, if we think we are in here, uh, or let's say we think we map somebody else out and let's say they're down there. Uh, you can do this with questionnaires and, and so on to see where the emphasis lies. And you would say, well, maybe what this person needs to do is to adjust their leadership style a little bit and maybe move it to there. Uh, because they, at the minute, are a little bit low on the concern for people. and This may cause longer term problems uh, with their team. And then we have contingency theories. And contingency theories, uh, really quite the opposite from classical management theory, Classical management theory said there is a right way, there is a set of golden rules for managing. Contingency theories of leaders or managers says there is no right way, it depends. It depends on the people, the task, the resources and so on. Uh, and we need to be flexible in our leadership styles. And as I say, you need to uh, know, if you like, the, the, the main keywords associated with these writers. So if we start with Adair, Adair is associated with action-centered leadership, and good leadership, again, means splitting your time a little bit. You have to show concern for the task and concern for the individuals. That, to some extent, was captured on Blake and Mouton's grid. But also, you have to show concern for the group. So you're kind of dividing your effort between these three. Uh, sometimes it's the group that needs to be motivated and turned on. Sometimes there might be a single individual who's having a problem and you have to give it attention and help perhaps to that person. Sometimes the whole project might be falling behind and what you need to do is, you know, have a look at the task and how can we catch up, how can we improve what we're actually doing. Venice had made a distinction between a manager and a leader. Uh, we'll see later on another writer does something very similar. Uh, Bennis said that a manager, very necessary person, uh, but is essentially an administrator and maintains and focuses on current systems and current tasks and current budgets. A relatively short term view, probably about a year. Uh, and keeps an eye on costs and revenues in the bottom line. 
The leader, by contrast, is an innovator. Uh, the leader will try to inspire people. Uh, the leader will be looking at, you know, work in a business be maybe three to five years time, a much longer term view. Uh, and, and, and a good leader will inspire people to follow them. A manager, you, it's rather more you do what you're told by the manager, not because you are maybe inspired by them, but because your manager is called manager. And this is known as basically positional power. Somebody gets their power from their position in the hierarchy, whereas a leader is maybe uh, relying on what is called charismatic power. And then it's distinguished between transformational and uh, transactional leadership. Transformational leadership is leadership. You're transforming the business maybe quite radically over three to five years. Transactional leadership, or maybe more rightly called transactional management, uh, is uh, doing things right. In other words, you're given the budget, we're going to get the budget. Whereas a transformational person will say, uh, you know, how can we branch out? How can we improve? How can we increase what the business is, 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 is capable of? Better said that the qualities of great leaders are integrity. They have to be honest with you, honest with customers, honest with staff. Uh, they have to be dedicated to the business, have to give a lot of time and attention to the business. They have to be magnanimous, which really means forgiving. So if you don't achieve a task, there's no point in them, you know, shouting at, at you really. They, 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 they should certainly have some sympathy perhaps, and at least investigate why you didn't achieve the task. And if you didn't win the, the tender and the contract this time, well, you know, it's maybe not that staff member's fault that they didn't do it. The bad leaders are always finger pointing saying it's every, everybody else's fault except mine. Humility, uh, for example, recognizing that it's the team that is responsible for success, not the manager. Openness, kind of links with integrity uh, a little bit. Uh, tell people what the problems are. Uh, tell people, you know, if they can't be promoted, tell them that they can't be promoted. Don't lead them on, if you like, by telling half-truths. And finally, creativity. A uh, problem comes up, a good leader will try to find a good solution to this, will not be bound by previous solutions, will have a creative mindset uh, to try to solve any problems. Havitz, adaptive leadership. Uh, you, you have to uh, he was saying give uh, work back to the people with the problem. Uh, in other words, if somebody comes to you with a problem, by all means support them, but then say, well, you know, what would you do? How do you think the, the best solution is going to be? Because they may well know the best solution, and what they require is confidence. Protect people from below. So in other words, uh, in, a, in a hierarchy, there may be people down towards the bottom, who have got very good ideas, but uh, in bad leadership setups, the leaders will be almost too arrogant to listen to these people from well below them. Regulate the distress. Uh, uh, in other words, you know, maybe don't don't go hysterical about uh, problems. Uh, try to say, okay, it could have been better, but if possible, say, you know, wasn't your fault this happened and so on. If people are feeling distressed and depressed, it's not going to be uh, very good for getting on with work. Pay discipline uh, attention to the issues. Don't let one issue uh, overtake all of the other ones. Most problems are not caused by one problem. Uh, most uh, difficulties in business are caused by a number of shortfall uh, uh, areas, and we have to make sure that all of those are addressed. And finally, move, this is rather pretentious, move between the bulk and the battlefield. In other words, sometimes the manager has to take a high viewpoint and see the big picture. And then sometimes the manager really needs to move down to the level of the people doing the work.
to really experience maybe the day-to-day problems that they are having, uh, which would be invisible from the balcony, if you like. So the manager needs to move up and down, taking the almost global view, the long-term view, the big view, if you like, and moving down to see the, the detail pressure and problems that individuals might have and to give them help, regulate their distress and so on. Fiedler. Fiedler uh, said that the effectiveness depends on what was called, first of all, your leadership style, uh, psych- psychologically close or distant. So a psychologically distant leader tends not to want any interaction or conversation with their employees. They'll be telling them what to do, kind of keeping them at arm's length, really. Whereas psychologically close leaders would be always in very good communication with their employees, always asking them for suggestions and so on. And secondly, situational f- favorableness, uh, the, 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 the degree to which the leader uh, can actually uh, exercise control and influence in this context. So if, if something uh, happens, if let's say a large customer decides to leave you and go somewhere else, uh, and has kind of made that decision already, then that's situationally not at all favorable because you've kind of made a decision and maybe signed up with a new supplier. If, however, the uh, customer is just grumbling a bit and there is a danger that they will move, then, of course, you still have time to influence what their decision is. There is situational favorableness. So what we need to uh, look at here is to think what sort of leadership style might be best uh, in uh, situational favorableness, where the situation is favorable, and where the situation is unfavorable. At the two extremes, if something is very straightforward and easy, or something is really, really difficult, almost impossible, the suggestion was a leadership style should be distant. Uh, but if something is, is kind of difficult, but not lost, but you need help, uh, how can we swing this customer who may be moving away from us, how can we swing them back to us, then it may be necessary to be more psychologically close because you need the help of all the people involved. Finally, uh, we have Cotter. Cotter, again, came back to transformational leadership and transformational change and transactional leadership and management. So it very much the same as you've seen with Benes uh, here. Uh, it is uh, the, the manager of plans and budgets, but it is the leader who says what direction we should be planning and budgeting in. Uh, it is the uh, uh, manager who will make sure there's enough staff with the right kind of qualifications, uh, but it is the transformational leadership uh, who says, well, we really need to up the game of all our staff to make them much more professional because we are thinking of moving the whole business up market and it's not any longer just a, a matter of counting staff and making sure they have the same, you know, the, the adequate current skills. We have to align staff, recruit staff maybe with the proper skills. Outcomes, uh, the transformational leader will often produce very dramatic outcomes, a real turnaround, uh, whereas the managerial person, it's more getting this time's budget, nothing terribly exciting. Examples uh, perhaps of a transformational leader uh, was probably someone like Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs founded Apple, left Apple, Apple got into problems and then came back uh, Jobs came back, was rehired, and of course he was responsible for developments like the iPhone, developments like iTunes and so on, 
very much changing the direction of the company, changing the sort of people employed. People would walk across hot coals from really very inspiring person uh, and of course produces very, very dramatic changes in the fortune of Apple.